Right, well, so this is our next uh, Meet the Speakers uh, video, even though it's Thomas and myself, so you've already met us probably, because if you've been to the comments over the last couple of years, obviously you'll know us already. But it, I think you just thought it'd be a great idea just to have a discussion about uh, what we're going to talk about at the conference and a little bit of background information to it, uh, sort of go off at a tangent. Uh, because uh, the, we've produced the the book, Boranger Sonia, uh, Priest, Wizard of Rangler Chateau, and we're going to put uh, the premiere of the video is going to be shown at the conference, and we're going to have questions and answers. So it, you'll you'll realize later on that there's a tangent that takes you off into the the pagan period. Um, like a repeat of the break up period. So we thought what we talk about is this time between paganism that led into the Christian period. So, uh, so, Charles, what I, what I thought I'd ask you is um, how you saw this pagan period before Christianity reared its head incredibly mysterious and i still do because there's so much mis missing information i think you know remember that time we went to the isle of man to make the film and we were looking at the uh the norse and the celtic artwork from that period and you don't know when the pagan period ended and the christian period began and in Ireland, especially like a long, long time ago, many years ago now, I when as a kid even, I couldn't figure out that period. Like I remember looking at the Round Towers of Ireland and I'm saying they make no sense. They're they're they're, they're not a you know ecclesiastical architecture. They're in just because they're in so many of them are in church areas or monasteries. I think they were here foot before. They're often built of different stone, like the one we went down to in County Clare. I think Kill Macdonough. The big one, the big tall one. That's a very different stone than what the the monastery beside it is made from. And so there was always a, a period there. And I, I wondered, you know, the Irish high crosses, they used to tell us when we were kids, well, that they show images from the Bible. And I was looking at them and saying, they could show anything. They could be anything. You know, that's just they're they're just pictures of figures. And then they would also I remember the National Museum of Ireland, they basically would show all this incredible artwork. And they would say, oh, it only happened when St. Patrick arrived. Like there was no previous mm. school of artisans and craftspeople that were doing. And also the things like the Ardash Chalice and the so-called Bishop's Crooks had all dragons and, you know, what they could call in Nordic art, the gripping beast. Mm. Uh, these, uh, you know, these are not Christians. They're not as pushed an element of any Christianity on it. So the period, what what is it? It's incredibly mysterious. And uh, it's also an, a phenomenally fascinating topic that is really, really worth exploring. Absolutely. I mean, I look at um, well, the question I get asked a lot on tours is the gargoyles and the grimaces that you hang down on churches. You say, why do Christian churches have these strange things? And I suppose, in a way, it's the same as the Green Man and the Shooter Gigs. That these things were existing existed before Christianity was there, and it just blended into the beginning of Christianity. So, I mean, this would have been a time when people would have venerated these gods like Pan in the in the landscape. Well, the, the one of the popes even was taught wrote letters to the to the the early church in England, and he said, "Just don't destroy the unclean idols of the Britons." that are in the churches, remove them from the churches, but keep the pagan temples intact for our religion because they're well made and well built. So that was one of them. That's one of the kind of like smoking guns of history is that the, the papacy upon the Christianization of Britain realized that they were, you know, just like with the round towers in Ireland, that these were gathering places of buildings that were very well made. And so no point in destroying them. We'll just adopt them and Christianize them. But we'll take the unclean idols out of them and we'll put them outside. Now, that's the gargoyles, isn't it? Right. You know, isn't that it? Yeah, yeah. And the ones they couldn't take out, like the green man and the shield and the gig, they incorporated it in almost all, 
nearly always into the church itself. Yeah, so the people in those days would have... Um, I mean, there's a place in Yorkshire called Robin Hood Stride, and it's a great big rocky outcrop right next to a stone circle. So that would have been an early meeting place. And I remember reading in... Um, that's one of the Irish book it was, but he it was he talked about this Radnor Stride as a dance. Uh, it wasn't it, what actually what you say what they said really is that this is a place where they would have done the Robin Hood dance like a pagan ritual in order to um, you know for the to, for the crops of wealth. Well, and uh, there's also a lot of stones uh, in in England called the Robin Hood Megalith or the Rock Robin Hood Men here. There's one right, like in Speak in Liverpool, very close. Not in Speak in uh, what, uh, I think it's in Allerton or Wollaston. It's near uh, Wollaston. It's near uh, John Lennon's house, actually, very close to it, and uh, it's called the Robin Hood Stone. Now, and it has all these scratch marks in it. Now, that also brings us into the, the Red Robin thing as well, which was a pagan yeah. ritual that wasn't very nice. But it was, well, maybe it was nice if they were killing a, you know, an Ashley person or something, that they would fertilize the crops with the blood of someone who was being executed. But um, that's a possibility that it, that it comes from that too. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Uh, the Dakar Bears in the Cumbria that you introduced me to, well, they were incredibly ancient idols. That were obviously found under the church and they stuck them in the graveyard. And that they're 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 just smoking gun right there of how gargoyles came about. They probably just Absolutely, took them on yeah. the outside. And then he probably instead of saying your gods are not inside, they're outside. And if you look at the, the shield in a gig, one of the most famous shield in a gigs is one that's actually in France and Normandy. It's used on all the cover of the books, the ones with just a big roundy head. That's not actually a shield in a gig. Jack, my late friend Jack Roberts, who died recently pointed out that that's actually a a gargoyle. So they took oh, the shield in the okay. gig outside sometime or they, they so they took this is where the gargoyles were. They were the unclean idols inside the temple. And then they were left them by making them as key and as, as horrible as possible to say to the locals that they're your old gods, they were all monsters. Right, yeah. So um people would have known about all these different and all these different strange uh, things that are hanging off church, like the gargoyles and the contest, people would have known about these, would they? And they would have been, before Christianity, they would have been part of their daily lives. Do you think? Or were they just made up later? I think there was a long transitional period. I think, you know, the, they were playing the long, the long game, the church. Definitely. They were definitely playing the long You have to understand, when you look at this topic, not you, I mean, in general, that you had Christianization in the Roman Empire first. It happened predominantly in places like Syria and Alexandria and in that part of the world, the Middle East. And a lot of it was very violent in terms of how it happened. You had the, the Christians in the early days were like ISIS on steroids and they destroyed the temple of Palmyra and they smashed all, you know, the iconoclasts. And they smashed the noses off statues of the ancient gods because they actually believed demons were inside them. And then eventually, through uh, almost becoming like the Scientology of the Roman Empire, Christianity became very fashionable among the elite. It's funny we're kind of seeing that again here today hmm. the, with the, with the way that you know the, the establishment are sort of fascinated with a certain Middle Eastern yeah, sect, yeah. you know, without going into details. But I think you know what I'm talking about. And so they all be, they all became fascinated with Christianity as a kind of a Scientology among the Roman establishment. And then Constantine the Great figured out, well, this is a perfect religion for the Roman army. And all he did was he took, because then it will not make them not afraid of debt, the specific rules, the specific things on dietary stuff. There's all kinds of things. There's You go to heaven when you die, you're guaranteed a place. So we don't have to pay a pension and this kind of thing. And being a, a, a conniving swine that he was, he made it the official religion of the empire, though he did not convert. In fact, on his tombstone in Rome, his, his, his memorial, it shows him at the end of his life making a sacrifice to the, at the Temple of Lupiter. So uh, he was a mm. pagan at the end. So he had that first, right? And then you had, so you had that, that, that Latin Christianity, which was very Jewish in terms of how it happened. 
one of the first, and then you had like Ar Armenian Christianity, very early Ethiopian. Now, one of the first places it spread to was these islands, particularly Ireland and like the north of England, Lindisfarne, places like that. And But that was a very different form of Christianity. It was a very similar to the Roman kind that existed. Now, but it didn't last long and it was very unstable. And this was, a, if you look at the history of the early church in Ireland, right up to the St. Malachi, there was this whole thing where this, it's, not, it's not happening. We're falling apart. The people constantly keep going back what they call the old fate, the old religion. So what happened then was then you had a sort of like a second kind of wave of Christianity when the, 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 the Vatican and the Roman Empire penetrated the, you know, the Christian Roman Empire what was left of it in the Western Empire, penetrating into Europe, into Central Europe and G Germany. And then they adopted Nordic things in my film, who, who, saved the, who, who Stole the All-Father. You can see how they fused the archetype of Odin with Jesus on the cross, the Odin on the Agassil tree, Jesus on the cross. And you see that in places like the Sandbach Crosses in Congleton and Cheshire in England, where they show Jesus as a heroic Lord and very different. He's an Odin type, he's a warrior. Very different than the, uh, the the image of the Prince of Peace. So they, it took it was a long process of bespoking Christianity into various cultures around Europe until they had it, you know, until they had like what we have now. And it was basically codified about a thousand years ago. So for the first like thousand, well, 800 years of Christianity, it was all about how can we make this stuff work? And the huge part of that was what we're talking about, changing things, changing for instance, up in, in the next the next time you're in this part of Ireland, I'll take up to County Mayo. And there's up on just past north of Kalala, near Kalala, south of it, is a, near where the Round Tower is, is a place called Down Patrick, where St. Patrick was supposed to have a magical battle with the Druids. Okay, And there are two magic crosses in the graveyard and they're shaped like Maltese crosses. And they're not Christian crosses. And it even says on the tourist you know, plaque on the wall, they're druidic crosses. So we know from Peter Knight and his work, in his books, yeah, yeah, they... took the, everyone everyone except the Christians were using the crucifix. They were using things like a fish or a set of keys or a cockerel. And it was, it, they only adopted the crucifix because it was being used by pagans because it represented the cardinal points. So this is, this is what makes a subject so fascinating. It is fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I suppose in a, in a, a way it was a, a power play by the the church because as, as the Roman Empire died off, so you're looking like 400 um, uh, AD, that sort of thing, that's when they invented the, the Christian um, uh, calendar. They backdated it, didn't they? They yeah. didn't sort of, it wasn't going from day, day one after Jesus was born. It was it was always something like year twenty of Caesar this Caesar that or whatever, yeah. and then they they decided I think at one eventually we're going to have to do something because we're losing our power we're losing everything's going we'll have to if we adopt this religion it's like clutching at straws in a way so they oh, backdated they the religion and then it was a case of um, yeah it was a power play and then then we we we're going to we're going to control by. Instead of the army and legions, we're controlled control by the church. And by God, that's worked, hasn't it? Yeah, well, even the way they used Mitra, Mitra, the Persian god, which is a pagan monotheism, monotheistic religion, was the most popular religion among the Roman military, among the army men in the Roman in Roman Empire, in both the Eastern and the Western Empire. And they took that, you know, they took that away and gave them Jesus born on exactly the same day to a virgin. He dies and rises from the dead yeah. three days later. They just change the name Mitra to Jesus. You know, I'm really not talking about Christians, but you know, if they only if they only knew how made up their religion is, they would, you uh -huh. know. But you can't. I mean, I'm not. It, what people believe is their own business. I don't care. But it, it's fascinating, and there's lots of things like that. They took holy feast days. They changed gods and goddesses. You have, you know, Bridget and Arnold was Breed and this kind of thing. You had that, yeah. The, 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 it's just completely endless how many things they 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 borrowed they borrowed from and made their own by just renaming it. You can see it so often on uh, every time you go to a, one of the old churches. I, you know, it wouldn't have been a bad 
belief system if it had stayed with the old pagan gods as well as the new teachings. Because a lot of the Christian teachings you have now were invented much later. I mean, even after the Synod of Whitby was 666, wasn't it, I think, AD? And that was about 664. And I think that was... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. some around them. And that was really when I think the Orthodox Catholic Church took over. But before that, I mean, it wasn't such a bad a bad uh, belief system. On the, on the, the Isle of Man, I uh, don't think we went down, it might be too muddy when we went, but there's a place called St. Patrick's Chair where there's three standing stones with big carved crosses on them. And that's said to be one of the earliest meeting places where people with pagan beliefs would have met there with this new teaching system coming over from um, the Levant or whatever and hearing and adding it to their pagan beliefs. Which would have been fascinating. Isle of Man is such a, such a, a fantastic lexicon of this stuff because yeah, you had yeah. the north, you had the Vikings in the north, the, the, the Gaelics in the south, and then the, all three being fused in the middle. Like you took me to one little church in the middle of the hills there that was so spooky and ancient. Mm. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but it was what I felt you like. Know, I, yeah. I felt like I I had gone back to like you know five hundred AD. You know, it felt like you know there's the title that Water Boys album, a pagan place. It didn't feel Christian, even though it was a Christian church. And I think it was called St Patrick's or something as well. The church, the, the Marone Church, the Marone. Marone, yeah, and it was supposed to be founded by St. Patrick or something like that. Yeah, yeah, they all, they all have that name attached to it, don't they? Yeah, even the little chapel in Glastonbury is, is was founded yeah, St. Patrick's yeah. Chapel. They both have founded that. Another, another, a uh, another smoking gun are the stave churches in Norway. Those incredible wooden churches that they built in Norway that have the dragons out the side, and in Norwegian folklore, they were built by Scottish and Irish artisans who'd come to Ireland after Ireland had fallen to Christianity, allegedly after St. Patrick's magical fire at Tara. And what were, you know, and, and you know, the Christians portrayed like Tara as like mud huts and like, you know, shacks and stuff oh, like that. When oh, it was a, it was a cap, it was basically the capital of an empire. It, if the state mm -hmm. churches came from that, that that architecture, it would have looked like Rivendell in Lord of the Rings. But they, they brought the Christians yeah. born around. The Christians born, that's what the magical fire was. But that's one thing I, I, I really gets me that when Christians did do this taking over bit, they were in times immensely brutal. They would just murder a whole race of people. And then you come back a couple of hundred years later. And these people are being brutalized. Won't hear a word against them. Yeah, yeah. I can't get that through my head, but it, it's. I mean, not really funny, the it? history of Christianity was genocide from the initial attack on Palmyra in Syria on the Roman Temple, and didn't end until the 1530s with the fall, the defeat of the Karelian pagans in the Third Swedish Crusade. A thousand, over a thousand years of genocide is how yeah. Christian, how Europe became Christian. Yeah, and now people you, just you think, can't, oh, you, so can't, you can't say that the Christians. I mean, I've got a page in my blog that lists just the the initial years of the of the the, the, the absolute the horrors that were inflicted upon pagans and Roman Greece, and you know, just that was just like a, it's only like two hundred years worth, and that was only just scratching the surface. Amazing, isn't it? I mean, and that's a fantastic place to move to, um, the longer dock, because. Um, Obviously, the Albigensian Crusade, where they burnt thousands of Cathars, just burnt them to death. You know, it's that in itself is mind blowing. Isn't it? When you went to, and they you know, were Christians, and they were thought they were Christians, and the same with the Reformation. Absolutely, and then, but what I've kind of realised, sort of fully now that in the longer dock, it wasn't just about burning Christians, it was about stealing the land off the Knights Templar who wanted to um because they were that was going to be their homeland, wasn't it? They decided they were going to live there. They were going to make it their own little little country, the Knights Templar country. So they had to because when you look at the dates, 
you got the Albigensian Crusade started about 1209, going right through to 1244, then the Inquisition carried on maybe for another 50 years after. And then when they rounded up the Knights Templar, that was only 1307. It's pretty much straight after, isn't it? It's so they killed all the the um the cathars off, stole all the land with the help of um what was it called? Uh, Tamar de Montfort, and then immediately killed off the the Knights Templar. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's I, I forgot, you know, for the for the Prince of Peace. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, you um, couldn't make you couldn't make this stuff up. I know, it's like, well, you know, I know, I know. You, you, there's no telling anybody, is there? But, but uh, so. Let's move on to our Boringer Sonia, shall we? Yeah. Because, um, well, I think the book's been out a while now, and so people know that we've we we decided that what happened to Boringer Sonia when he when his priest that became a mentally rich in Renly Chateau in the Longer Dot, that region we we're just talking about, he'd kind of, for what you said, had reversed this process. Of paganism to Christianity and just reverting back to paganism again. It's very interesting. Before we get directly to him, it's very yeah. interesting how the the church had this conflict for many centuries that somehow we've lost something when we gave up paganism, and they they started to bring many things back into it that had pagan origins. And one of them, you know, and there's and when it was formalized or codified in word, say with Augustine or Origin of Alexandria, there were these debates about like the pagan loss kind of thing. We're missing something. And that's that's that was there for many centuries. It even may have led to the the split in the the, the church, the, the Orthodox Church, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church kind of retained a very strong paganistic feel. And even the Catholic as well, and is you know that's why you know Temple Saint Peter's Temple as Church Basilica looks like the way it is because it's based on a Roman temple. That's why that's what they would have looked like inside, beautifully ornate. So when Mark Martin Luther was saying Christian the Catholic Church is pagan idolatry, he wasn't really lying. And all the saints and all the pictures of the saints, they were just all. To give them back their own gods, so you don't have statues of Apollo and Demeter and you know this kind of thing. They gave them icons of Saint Patrick and the Holy Mary and the Holy Virgin and Saint Francis of Assisi and so on. So they they always knew they lost something. And when we were in the Landerock and we went in, we we're staying in Ale Laban. You very much get the impression that the bishops were down there talking to the Kabbalists and to the Cath their prefects. And they were asking them questions about, they wanted to know. They knew they had something that they were lacking. And the church, this is what's in the Vatican archive. People say, what is inside the Vatican archive? It's a huge occult archive. I'm convinced of it. I'm convinced it's, a, it's a, all the stuff that they learned from the Kabbalists and from the Cathars are in there. Because they know that within this, 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 this stuff that is forbidden from the Bible, magic, is they need that too. And Sonia yeah, 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 yeah. did it. Sonia did it. He did, didn't he? Yeah. So, um, but it, it wasn't just him as well. There was like other priests around him that were all involved in it, as if, as if it was a thing that was semi-acceptable still in that sort in that sort of, sort of area. Well, it could think... only be done. It could only be done that period because the Catholic Church in France had lost its power because of the revolution. So, in post-revolutionary France. Particularly, mm. particularly after the Second Republic, it became almost very atheistic. So what he was doing was what the Templars were doing back in 1300s. But the church didn't have the power by the time he was doing his stuff. So he didn't have to worry about being, you know, tortured to death and born to life. Yeah, yeah. And uh, by God, did he. And there was um, a massive search on, wasn't there, for you saying yeah. that... Um, the church could see when well, the church and royalty were kind of, you know, were, were they were in revolution were fighting together, weren't they? Particularly so, in France. Uh, yeah, uh, because I mean, Sonia got 
um, sent to Nubon as a punishment for giving royalty, pro royalty speeches. So uh, the, and he was tied up with royalty, wasn't he? So it, it was that thing that they were very much seeking what they'd lost. And I basically that's the, the crux of the matter, isn't it? That's the thing that it was all based on. They were searching for paganism again, something that was... Well, that's why people like us, not just me and you, but the people who are into our work or the people we follow or the people who are in this scene, they are, that's why they find places like Glastonbury fascinating. They find the Lander and the Chateau fascinating. They find the Greek islands fascinating. They know that there's something in their past that has been taken from them, and they feel it. Now, they're given all kinds of nonsense and distractions like the Magdalen bloodlines and all that nonsense, but they're given, they're give, they know, that's true, that's to bring them back into Christianity, by the way. They they know this, that we, you know, people go to Glastonbury, yeah, it's, you know, it's a, there's, a, there's a big monastery, the ruins of an abbey, there's this Arturian legend, but they go, but there's something, there's something more to it. You know, it's almost like, well, what that feeling that they have, and that feeling you get in places like Glastonbury, mm. Is that feeling of that period of the crossover between Christianity and uh, paganism? It is definitely. As I was just thinking, of, yeah, because you do feel it, don't you? You definitely feel it longer. Now, can you get as you drive into Glastonbury? Sometimes you can get that. It you, you call it a cult feeling, but it's a it's a feeling that is very much one you resound with. It's like it's, it's you, isn't it? Yeah, it's very hard to it's very hauntological in that sense that you have a longing for a place you've never been, but yes. you know you should be there. So in some part of you should be there. Yeah, you're coming home to a place that you can't remember. Yeah, Clon Macnoise on the River Shannon definitely has that. You're like, I've yeah. been, I, 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 I'm a part of this. I've been here. What's really going on here? You know, people feel yeah, it. Yeah. In fact, we had this very conversation in that little church. Yeah, club at least. Yeah, uh, and that, that place is loaded with mysterious artifacts, not just the two round towers, but there's also the West Cross, which is called the Cross, which is just basically a stone straight that has all these intricate carvings and looks like it's been under the sea for thousands of years. It's one of the things that got me thinking as a kid about that thing looks like it was under the ocean. And it's been, you know, and got me thinking about Atlantis. There was maybe Atlantis was a real yeah. place, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing, isn't it? When you this Atlantis thing, I just thought it was ridiculous for ages, and then slowly dawns on you, doesn't it? Oh, just yeah, a minute, because it there's, there's, there's other artifacts that make, make sense, you know, mm. that are just hold on a second. This is they, they, what's this now? And that was that was the one for me was the West Cross at Clon Macnoise in the in the museum there. I'm like that that shouldn't exist. That yeah, just shouldn't what's exist. going on? Yeah. Maybe it was underneath, well, underneath the sea or underneath. It's right next to um, the River Shannon, isn't it? So yeah, uh, and maybe, maybe, been... maybe the Shannon came in before, maybe the sea came up that far back then. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the central part of Ireland, a lot of the central part of Ireland is like Holland has been reclaimed and drained. So uh, paganism, well, it's a uh, fascinating subject, and. Uh, do you think do you think it's a thing that people are actually learning to connect? Because the problem is, how can I say this? Neo paganism doesn't seem to be paganism. Oh, it's absolutely not. It's more it's more Jewish. I'm not putting down Jewish things or anything, but it definitely is. It has saints like you know, it has what you call it, it has angels that are straight from the Old Testament and stuff like that. You know, Gabriel. Yeah. Michael and people and characters like Lilith, these are not your pagan at all, you know. And it then it purports to throw in things like that. It tries to be well, we know the history of Wicca, don't we? It was invented by Crowley and Gardner as a way to keep people who were too dangerous out of uh, the Lima. And uh, they invented the Wiccan road. And, and you mean, even, you know, what was her name Dorian Valentine? Years later, she got people. People did admit to her. No, Crowley wrote the Crowley invented the and she had to frantically yeah. rewrite it. You know? But I've I've visited, you know, I obviously got involved in these sort of organisations years ago, 
and they didn't seem healthy to me at all. You oh. know, I thought this is just not right. It's um, but when you look at what paganism actually was, the whole idea of um, just being at one with nature and sort of maybe the in early uh, magic we called it thought thought, thought form. You create a, a thought form. So these are maybe I don't know if you agree with this, but the the old pagans are energy thought forms that are. Uh, you well, they can... did not, you know, there, there, there were people that seemed a lot, a lot of, when I go to see, when I hang out with, when, when I've been in a company of pagans, sometimes you can't help it at ancient sites, I'm mm. struck by how many of them are walking with walking sticks or disabled, yeah. have serious health problems and stuff like that. And it's like, and I, of course, it's none of your business to go up to someone and say anything. But I think to myself, you're in negative charisma. Your charisma yeah. is actually in negative. Like if you're... Yes. Yeah, if you're yeah. in a magical existence, you're in, your charisma improves. You become more charismatic. And yet these people, you wouldn't want to spend more than 10 seconds with them. And, you know, yeah. I, I, I've never, you know, I've never, I, I've, you know, it's very strange. And the neo-pagan thing, like the neo-Druidic stuff, and then you have the, the Nordic paganism, which is incredibly churchy. And it's like, it's like Lutherism without the, without Jesus. It's like they go hail instead of amen. And this kind of thing, and you have uh, Tina Kemp brought a fabulous article on her Substack yesterday, just about this. You know, there, the, 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 I think ultimately it comes down to a lack of honesty. I have this argument with people about shamans. I know people come in and say that they, they, they do shamanic work, and so what do you do? I bang a drum in a field. I said if you were to encounter a real Native American shaman, or a Siberian shaman, and a Samoan or a Magyar shaman. You would absolutely die of shock if you saw what they do to get into the spirit world. You know, you're, what you're doing is banging the drum and singing um, um, by ah. That's what you're doing by comparison. Yeah, so I've become a high priest. Well, 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 did you spend 15 years in a cave meditating? Oh, I college last weekend for weekend course. Like it's, it's just... I know. Or ha <laughs> you know that film with Richard, Richard Harris, A Man Called Horse? And he's suspended on hooks. That's exactly what they do. Yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. they would go through extreme pain thresholds to actually, you know, re, be, be reborn, basically. But in a way, you know, it's it's a sad thing, really, that people seem to be... It's not a misdirection. Everything is misdirection, isn't it? Yeah. There's so much of it. And it's such a shame because... I know, but there's also I, I knew one woman and I, I know I shouldn't talk negative about the dead, but I'm not talking I'm just I'm stating facts. She was like a, a Wiccan priestess here, right? And she was Wiccan this, Wiccan that, and and you know, quite arrogant about it and quite dismissive of people. She thought she really was some kind of living goddess or something. Well she died a few years ago and where guess where they buried her? In a Church of Ireland graveyard. Of course they did, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. There's such a lot of arrogance about it, and like you say, they, they, they're all. You shouldn't be talking like this, but they're all, they're all ill, aren't they? It, it's, it's, and well, if, you, if you see so many people ill, then and physically, well, physically not right, then something you're doing is causing this. And not happy, very little they're happy. happy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a pagan. If you, you get the impression when, you expect, well, it's not much. The documents that do exist. Uh, they are predominantly Roman and Hellenic paganism. And if you read about things like the festival of, you know, the rites of Elysium, these were joyous family events, yeah, yeah, yeah. bacchanalias, they were fun parties, the, you know, the liberalias, they were, they were all about the enjoyment of life and the celebration. And when you had a, like with, like with, uh, you know, Asmodeus being with the, uh, Sonnier at Rennes Le Chateau. These were glorious banquets. And Asmodeus was there with you. Bacchus was there with you at the Bacchanalia. Dionysus was there. Anne was there with you when you went for the fields. You know, when you went to and into the celebrate, like the, in Arcadia, you know, and that that's that famous painting by Poisson. And so the, and yeah, and that's all but that none of that exists in Wicca. No, no. And and I suppose Christianity has spent so long making us feel guilty about just enjoying the world. You know, yeah. that to me, the world's a fantastic, amazing place. I go out, we go out on the tours in the, in the hills, in the 
because Mount, I went up the, stopped in a hotel a couple of days ago on top of the Pyrenees, and it was just, just to be in the mountains and enjoy it and have a nice meal in the evening, enjoy yourself. But this guilt of Christianity has seeped through to the neo-paganism, and they don't seem to be able to enjoy well the, the, their existence. And the dourness of Lutherism and yeah. Calvinism has made its way into Nordic paganism, where it's all very serious and, you, you know, this kind of thing. And even enjoying yourself has not this kind of serious, the serious thing about it, you know. And, and, and if we, you know, because they're Vikings, they must have been tough and hard. I bet if we went back then, they would have been just like the Greeks and Romans or anyone else having a party and enjoying what they could. Now, that's interesting what you said about about life in the land rock there, because isn't that what the Cathars said? That, you know, as long as there's wine, good wine and good music, this isn't such a bad price to pay for being alive. And I always thought that was a very pagan attitude they had. They had the troubadours, didn't they? Yeah. And they would go from castle to castle, bringing a party with them. Oh, Imagine yeah. the, the noises, all of a sudden, all of a sudden you'd hear the bang, the bang, the bang, and a bit of whistling and some music going on and the troubadours are arriving and all of a sudden you're in the middle of a massive party. Well, they, they, they invented uh, like kind of the rock show, the rock tour. So the troubadours would tour from town to town. And if you like when a circus came to town in the old days, that be they'd come into the streets playing their music and instantly cheer everybody up. Not very much a longer dot thing. Yeah, yeah. But this, I mean, we should be appreciating what we've got on this beautiful planet that we're in instead of, I mean, that's how, you, when you appreciate something, that's how it grows. If you hate it and this, and are always complaining and fearful about it, that just kills everything off, you know? And, and yeah, it, well, back, it's back, bad. Back, back to Christianity and the Abrahamic religions, original sin, you are born with sin. Now, that's a, a, that's just like, what what a what insurance policy for those religions? You were born of sin, and you're going to have to spend the rest of your life with us to get out of that sin and get into the next life. Then, then you'll enjoy yourself. And yeah. you've got to give stuff up. I mean, how many people give things food? You've got to, I'm going to become a vegetarian. We're going to become a vegan. Yeah. I'm going to start. Oh, that, uh, that all comes out of Lent and penance. Yeah, it's just stop giving up. <laughs> or, or look how we look how we damage our own societies. Now we're getting I'm not getting political here, but a little bit. Take up thy bed and give it to the stranger. No. Oh, well has uh, you know okay. <laughs> we'll leave we'll we'll leave that out there and you can take it wherever yeah. you want. Yeah. Or 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 turn the other cheek. Love thy enemy. That's all designed to make you weak and easy to That was exactly what happened, yeah. And then that came from the the Roman um, takeover as well as power. I mean, the best thing best thing to do if you're going to take over society is to infiltrate it and make it weak in some way yeah. before you do. Well, in the pagan Roman Empire, it was incredibly diverse and multi-ethnic. There was every single race that existed in Europe and Middle East was in the Roman army. But the job thing was you were a soldier and that was your job. Your religion was your own yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The pagans were so tolerant. They didn't care what your religion was once you didn't start an army, you know. And the Christians started an army. That's a plenary indulgences. You know, when mm. Catholics pay money to, to absolve their sins in, in, in heaven. That's, the that, that, that's where the carbon taxes came from. But, you well, know, exactly, yeah, yeah. And yeah, also yeah. the Abrahamics have always been at war with the cow and the bull because it was the first god of the, the, in the European people. So you remember Moses is the golden calf, and he he found them worshiping the golden calf, and he you know the unclean idol, and so the cow was kind of considered like an unclean idol, and now we have you know telling us that cow farts are destroying the planet. Oh, yeah. it's it's an interesting it's interesting how those archetypes always come back, isn't it? Always come through. So speaking of long term things, do you think that um, the old pagan gods? Um, Still exist? Do you think they are? Do you think, or do you think they fade away as people stop? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think they fade away. I think they, you know, uh, that it's like that fantastic nineteen seventy four British film, Pendus Fen, that they they come back to life when you acknowledge their existence, 
and they're there waiting for you. You know, they're there waiting for you. And all through history, there's been certain characters that have been kind of come kind of like, I'm fascinated by St. John. There's, there's something about her that's very pagan. John oh, John of John of Arc. Yeah, very much so. That's a fascin that's a subject I want to dive deeply into at some point in the future. And there's um there's other things we have the the Cathars, and we had things like Rosicrucians, but also we had, you know, Theosophy and Steiner and all these people. They were they were slowly resurrecting the pagan gods through the back door in different ways. They may have been giving them different names, but I absolutely do believe that pagan is paganism is the future. But it won't be neo paganism. It'll be based on natural law. It'll be. Yeah, yeah. It'll it'll. I could see something like Tolkien's. I could definitely like someone I I I was referred to Tolkien's, Lord of the Rings trilogy as the European Bible, and I think there's a lot of truth in something like that. And I think something like folklore and stuff, as we got become more transhumanist, will become more deeper and more meaningful to people like us. And I think we'll in in a kind of a default way, we'll escape into paganism uh, because it is in alignment with natural law. Yeah, we, we, I hope so because I mean paganism really is a it's a thought it's a a mindset of gratitude, isn't it? Yeah, and and a, a belief in natural natural the the natural cycle to the universe, and you know mm. it, it has an intelligence and it, and it, and it does balance the books in every way. This kind, no matter what kind of names you give to, whether it's Hinduism or Mitraism or Celtic or Germanic or English paganism, it it comes back to that. But I think yeah. it's like you talking about that sense of longing. You know, I get that when I'm in England and I I, I read about Heron the Hunter or, or you know things, mm. and that's not that's not even pagan. Or when I even watch the Lord of the Rings films, I, I it's, it, it something happens. That's that feeling again comes back. And that's that's the that's our ancient ancestors talking through us, unlocking these DNA codes. Now, and as pagans, our job is not to, you know, proselytize. We don't convert people, you know. Yeah. But I think I think yeah. if you live by example, I think that's one of the reasons they went after the Cathars. They were happy Christians, and they were a bad example in the rest of them. You can't allow that, can you? Really, people go around being happy. They wanted them miserable and afraid of the devil and and debt. Yeah, so I think things will just take their own process, their own direction now, because I suppose the, the church has really had its day, hasn't it? It's not. They're, they're still there, but the Christianity is not what it used to be, is it really? But it had its day with the, with the, with the Renaissance. It really did, because the Renaissance was really what it was, the return of the classical world. And when they started doing the, the public works in places like Milan and Rome, and pulled out these incredible 2,000 years old statues out of the rivers and stuff. They couldn't believe it because the Christians had smashed all the other ones and they couldn't believe they were pulling these things out of like these incredible artworks. And then they realized how much they lost. And overnight, literally overnight, not just in Italy, but all around Europe, particularly in places like Germany and England, you had a, a massive advance that brought us back to, it really was a renaissance that brought people back to the time of the pagan Roman Empire because they'd realised we'd lost all this art because of the iconoclast that destroyed, as in Catherine Nixby says in her book, 70% of the art and science of the pagan world. If it wasn't for those old guys in the Greek symposiums running away from the Christians carrying their scrolls into Persia, we would have never known about Archimedes and Pythagoras and Plato. And you just think about that. And those things, so it's it's been coming back ever since the Renaissance. And this is why universities deal in Latin, they deal in Greek. This is why, because we know that sense of loss, that we lost something when we uh we when we when we lost the, the old pagan the old pagan gods. This is like what we do when we go and visit the old stone circles and the old ancient sites. That yeah. that is a, a grasp hold of this thing that we've lost, isn't it, really? Yeah, and you even get that feeling, like I had people say to me, you get that feeling to our old Christian sites, but they're Christian. And I said, ah, but they weren't Christian originally. They were, the, the mm -hmm. energy that was originally there remains. There's a place called Holy Island, again on the River Shannon, down towards County Limerick. And there's actually a stone circle with a, with a, with a Roman church built over. 
around. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I've seen these things. We go to a place on the New Year to it, a dolmen with a church built over it. And you can still go into the dolmen underneath, and they've made a little chapel inside there as well. Uh, is that the one in Portugal? No, that's in uh, Brittany. Yeah, there's one Brittany. in Portugal, uh, definitely one in Portugal, there's a couple in Sardinia like that. Yeah, and then, and then when you look at things like the Rudston monolith in the yeah. right next to the church, and they couldn't move it because it's so big, it yeah. dwarfs the church. I mean, it, I mean, it's so obvious that all these places. I mean, why would you do that unless you could already feel an exactly. energy that existed? Yeah, and, and you wanted you... to continue it. Yeah, exactly, uh, and. Uh... The power of its endurance after all these centuries, could you only imagine how colossal the charge was back in the day? No wonder no the they had to spend a thousand years genociding Europeans in order to remove it. Well, they still haven't managed to fully do that. No, and they never will. And that, they, 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 that chap, what's his name, Martin, up in Aberdeenshire, the recumbent oh, stone. Yeah. Martin Morrison, yeah. Yeah, Martin Morrison. The, the the Puritan stone killers tried to destroy all them back about back in the, the Puritan times, and they gave up after a while because they realized they could not only could, there was too many of them, but they it wasn't destroying the the, the what they called the idolatry in the landscape. Yeah, so they they just called them all devil stones. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, evil. If they're not giants, they're, they're not giants. This or giants that. They're devils. This. And in Ireland, and not every every odd standing stone was called St. Patrick's this, St. Patrick's that. He went around a lot, that guy, didn't he? Oh, but there's an interesting one. He was invented by a, a an acronite bishop called in Ossery, which is down in County Offaly, uh, called oh. Aid of a, a, Aid of Slet Aid of Slettery was the bishop's name, right? Aid oh. is the Irish god of the underworld. I'll leave you with oh. that. Wow, imagine that. Yeah. Right, I suppose we've been, I don't know how long we've been chatting, but it, I think it's been a while. Yeah, nearly an hour, yeah. So let's, uh, only thing to say is the conference. Um, tell, them about, tell them about the conference, I'm always doing it, you can do it for a change. Well, the conference, what's it, my fourth year there now, I think it is, is ha now it's held in a very nice big spacious hall with a huge screen, with room for everyone, in St. Anne's near Blackpool in Lancashire in the north of England. A very easy place to get to from anywhere. Scotland, England, Ireland, you name it. It's got, you know, you're coming from overseas outside these islands. There's Manchester Airport's not far away. And uh, it's a weekend of just really interesting stuff. I mean, that's how I find it. I find it like I, 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 I always learn things. It's very friendly. There's loads of stalls to buy stuff. And speaking of stalls, I will be there with Sarah Mondaini. We will be selling. We will be releasing the Hocus Pocus book on the day. And it'll be the only chance you'll probably ever get in the history to have both of us sign the book. So that, you know, so to be there if you want that, right? And uh, along with Neil's film, which I've already seen, and uh, I'm a bit jealous because he's done a too good, a, a really good job. Uh, yeah. Maybe yeah. not as artistic as I tend to be. Not as probably... good as you always. Let's be oh, well, I, I, well I, I'm a bit arty farty, but I have to say, when I watched it, when I was finishing what, Ed, Ed, with watching yours, I was like, Jesus, he really told that story well. So you get to see that, right? And then the questions by me and Neil afterwards. And um, I, okay, that's it. That's all I can say. It's it's a lot of fun, and we it's a it's a it's a, a, a lot of interesting stuff to learn, and and the the, the book stalls alone are fantastic as well as all the other things, and always nice people. And the hall has like a lovely coffee shop, cafe, cafe in it. Uh, so you, and, and, and the place, because it's a holiday resort, is surrounded by lots of places to go and eat and hang out and stay. So I think, Neil, you should talk about the guests, uh, the speakers. Yeah, well, okay. Um, quick rundown on the speakers is, well, obviously we're starting off for the first uh, hour or so. Um, to do by memory, there's uh, David Malmberg. Now, David is uh, American. He's coming over just for this, and he's a he's a very famous ventrilo ventriloquist and Spanish guitar player. 
and he's really well known in America. I've seen his the audiences, and he's got his own records out and all this different stuff. But he's also a member of uh, a Masonic, uh, pure Masonic group that actually go into the mysteries and learn the mysteries properly. So, uh, and he's an adept as well. So, well, he's got a really amazing. Uh, he's got, he wants to talk about how oh, ventriloquism was part of the early pagan um, religion. So, or at times, it wasn't really religion. So, that's going to be fascinating. I'm not, I'm not sure he was. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know what he's going to say yet, but it's, uh, I think, I mean, you don't get that anywhere else, do you? That's a, that's a one off. And thank God for he's coming all the way over it. Um, is he bringing, is he going to bring a, a ventriloquist doll? I, I, I'm gonna, I'll ask, Charlie, ask, I, I might ask him to. I know they're traveling a bit, him and Cheryl is his partner, but. Um, uh, it, 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 otherwise, it'd be a bit like uh, when I went to see Lloyd Poy and he didn't bring the Star Child school. And someone who told me it's like Keith Harris didn't bring Orville. Check out Hello. Um yeah, who else have we got? Well, oh yeah, of course. It's the twenty years of the Da Vinci Code, isn't it? So we've got Lynn Picnic and Clive Prince. The people who were responsible for providing all the information to Dan Brown in the first place about the film and the book. So I mean, we've got the the two stars there, really. I mean, they, they came 10 years ago for the 10-year anniversary, so they've come back. I sent them a picture of the three of us 10 years ago, and they had brown hair and slim. So it was, like, really uh, weird. <laughs> the, the last, the last since the Rona, that's the all age badly. Oh, it's been talking about keeping the weight off now, but uh, anyway, that's a different thing. Um, yeah, well, there's... Uh, the, 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 there's eight speakers basically, and nine this is Lynn and Clive. So it's going to be fantastic. Look on the website; that's the main thing. Uh, I won't bore you with them all now, but uh, just look at megalithictours.com. Uh, click on Mysterious Earth Conference, and you can get your ticket there. It's obviously filling up, so uh, it's I mean it's only a couple of months now, isn't it? It's eight weeks or something. There's the 7th and 8th. It's over oh. the weekend, the 7th and 8th of September. So now is the time to book. Yeah, really. yeah. It's tight, it's, tight, it's tight now. I, that's scary that you told me that, because I've got... Well, yeah, oh, yeah, it's like it's funny how time suddenly catches up on you, isn't it? You're not ready you know, for it. It's July already. Where I've, got to, go? I've got to book my ferry ticket then. Yeah. Yeah, you got to, right, yeah. I'm trying to remember the name of the hotel that we... We, we have changed the hotel this year. Um... The Glen Dower. Last year we stopped in a different hotel. This year we're going to stop in a hotel called the Glen Dower Hotel. It's also on the seafront like it was last year, but if anyone wants to be in the same place as some of the speakers and Thomas and myself, it's the Glen Dower Hotel. It's the best Western hotel. It should be really nice. So I think that'll do for now, won't it? Yeah. Uh, so I'll see, you, I'll see you all in September. And... Uh... I'm sure it'll be fantastic fun, as it always is. Certainly can't wait. See you all September. And uh, bye for now. Bye-bye.